and you are free to go. Perfect, let's go. So, well, hello everybody. Uh, thank you for coming here today. My name is uh, Thomas. I'm a French tech slash backend lead engineer at Abil Tokyo and currently working at AXA Live Japan. So today we are going to talk about uh, Dino, Danet, one of its framework, and we'll talk about open source in general and more specifically how to do an open source project. I mean, at least my point of view on the subject and how to maintain it. So first and foremost, um, what is Dino? So, well, Dino is a JavaScript and TypeScript runtime. I would like to put emphasis on TypeScript, but we'll see that a bit later. It's built with web standard security and developer experience in mind, which means that the code you write for the browser should be able to run on Dino without any issue. Security, because you don't want any third party packages to send your data in a remote server. And developer experience basically means that it has to be simple and easy enough to work with. Otherwise, you will not have any big user base and it's a pain to work with. But we'll see that a bit later. And it's made in Rust. Basically, you know, the crab language, pretty cool language, C++ child, and so on. But, well, we're not here to talk about Rust. So the question we might have is, why did we need another JavaScript runtime? Because we already had Dino, uh, we already had Node, sorry. Um, it's already open source, it works well. We have Bun, and then now we have Dino. So why do we need so many competitors in the same market? Uh, the, the answer is quite simple. Does anybody recognize this man? If yes, write it in the chat or you can say it out loud. And if not, I will obviously give the answer in a few seconds. I'm checking in the chat just in case. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, Leo, exactly. Thank you. So this name is Ryan Dahl. He's the creator and founder of Node.js, and he's also the founder and creator of Dino. So basically, uh, to quote him in his talk, Force Optimization, that he gave a few months ago, um, he created Node.js to force people to create optimized web servers by providing them with non-blocking I.O., also called async I.O., because otherwise, in that time, when you wanted to create a web server, let's say in Java, you had to deal with threading and multi-threading because all the action were blocking on the system. And well, uh, Ryan decided that it was not a good way to do optimized server, so he created Node.js. But that was in 20, uh, that was in 2008, and. 10 years later in 2018, having an optimized web server is way much more thing. Um, we now have a tool chain to manage. So if you come from a node background, you have um, NPM, Yarn, you then have PNPM and many other package managers. So you might have to switch between them when you switch project or companies. And you might need to set up your repository with specific things in mind related to your package manager. So if you change from one to another, it can be quite cumbersome. Um, we also have to think about cloud architecture. Um, if it will be running on Google Cloud or AWS, if it will be running on Lambdas, if you need to be, uh, if it needs to be behind the Kubernetes cluster or not. And after you made this very important choice, you then have to manage everything. Uh, it's the ops part of the DevOps job, uh, which, well, is not an easy job. And it's always better to have something easier. So async, of course, is still needed. Uh, it's becoming a standard, I guess. Uh, we have to manage the supply chain security, which means that, like I said previously, you don't want any third party packages to steal your data and send them to remote server. Um, it's already happened in the past with NPM packages that has been poisoned and then you update them and then all your files are sent to a remote server and you had no way to know that. Uh, it's of course changing because Node.js is trying to implement uh, security flags, but it wasn't here at the beginning. And the DX uh, developer experience is of course important. We have so many mature frameworks in the ecosystem now 
that uh, you need to have a really good developer experience to be able to onboard new people in your project. Uh, you want one CLI to do everything for you. You don't have to think about them. And we basically want magic uh, because magic is cool. And so this is why um, uh, Ryan decided to create Dino as if he was starting to create nodes, but 10 years later. Um, then uh, I guess around 2020 or so, uh, I decided to create the Dino company. So the Dino company is a for-profit company, obviously doing two big things. The first one is Dino, the runtime. Uh, so on the left, which is the open source part of the company, it's easily accessible. Uh, zero config secure by default. They recently added a built in key value database, which runs directly on Dino. So you don't have to worry about choosing a database provider. You can just use it, which is because it's built in. And recently they added node and npm package support. Because basically, Dino uh, run four years without handling node and npm packages. It didn't want to uh, handle them at all. Dino was supposed to be a competitor of Dino of Node, which is own ecosystem uh, in a parallel track. Uh, and then because Dino wanted a bigger user base, they decided to support Node and NPM packages. Uh, a little shift in paradigm about it. Um, also a small revolution because many people left the company at this point because they didn't want to do anything with Node. But yeah, that's life. And then you have the money maker of uh, the Dino company, which is Dino Deploy, which is a hosting service for your Dino application. So you have excellent latency everywhere because it's uh, running on a Google Cloud Provider, so GCP for short. Um, you, of course, uh, it's serverless, so you benefit from the GCP performances and availability around the globe, and you don't have to manage anything. And recently, with the addition of the built-in key value database. You now have key value data replication across all the GCP um, data centers with encryption at rest and on fly. On fly. Um, it will be probably much more thing uh, in the following months because Dino V2 is coming this summer. It has been announced by Ryan a few months ago. Uh, they're starting to do a few talk about it later in July. So Unfortunately, my talk is a little bit too early to be able to give you a sneak peek at V2. But hey, just go on Twitter and follow Dino, and you will get all the necessary information. So that's basically all about Dino. I know it's uh, demo slash Dino time. Uh, it's cool to talk about it, but I guess it's also cool to see how it works directly. So let me just share my screen. This one, perfect. So uh, basically, first thing first, when you so add, uh, so when you want to start, uh, a new project on Dino, well, the first thing you do is read the documentation. So you go on Dino.land, you go on the installation part, and you have all the process to install Dino on your favorite OS. I'm currently running on uh, Windows, so I have a Windows subsystem for Linux running Ubuntu. Um, I already did installation because, well, it would have been, uh, it would have taken some time, so uh, no point. So we have Dino install. I can check that by doing Dino version. And we also have old version that you the confirmation. So first thing we start uh, to do when we um, Try a new runtime or new language. We do a Hello World um, software and we like traditional one here, so let's do it. I create a hello.js file. I will do kind of complicated Hello World for my uh, own reason, but you will see. Uh, I'll do that in a few minutes. But pretty standard. Uh, yes, it's doing an Hello World. Uh, I can run it with Dino doing hello.js. It works. I can do node run hello.js. Nani. 
Hmm, it was supposed to work. Um, Uh, and it works on also, but we are in 2023 and JavaScript in the past, we want to do everything in TypeScript. So let's just uh, to a TypeScript file and add some typings. The TypeScript, so we type everything. And if I try to run, in, run it, uh, in Node, it doesn't work, obviously, or we, as we all know. Uh, in order to work, we'll, we'll need to install um, third patch packages or install TypeScript to uh, compile it. But in Dino, uh, well, you just do it you know, the TS and it works. You don't have to worry about everything, uh, about anything. You don't have to install the packages to run TypeScript's uh, project on Dino. It just works out of the box. So that's part of the developer experience uh, points I was talking about. But uh, let's be honest, we don't do Hello World uh, program often in a real environment. So let's just create a um, small web server. So, and also the TS because we do everything. Uh, for different purposes, I will use Oak as a framework to create a server. Uh, you have many ways to create web server in, in Dino, but I just choose Oak because it's easy. And it comes from Koa uh, in the Node.js ecosystem. So I just copy and paste everything in my Node.js file, and I try to run it uh, with Dino. And as you can see, I don't uh, set any permission for it to run. So Dino is explicitly asking me for permission to listen to a port. Uh, you have many security flag uh, in Dino. It could be reading a file, writing a file, accessing your environment uh, variable, and of course, listening and sending requests to an external server. Um, because like I said, Dino is built with security in mind. So everything you want to do needs to be explicitly allowed. Otherwise, uh, well, you might have a third party package that has been poisoned and sending your data to a remote server. So I just allow my program to listen. And let's see if I have my term. But uh, having a local API is not really useful. What we want when we code an API is for it to be accessible to everybody in the planet, or at least in the country you want to operate. So let's quickly deploy it on Dino Deploy. So you can see how easy and fast it is. So same as before, going to the Dino website, you have deploy here. Um, you can sign up and see the documentation. Obviously, I already have an account. So I just sign in. I create a new project. Uh, you can choose a template if you want so, or if you already have a GitHub repository, you just select it. That's our case for demonstration purposes. I select my account um, on GitHub, I don't need any build step. Uh, even if it's a TypeScript pro project, I don't need any build step because Dino is running TypeScript out of the box. So I can select no build step and I need to select an entry point, which I didn't push. Um, mm -hmm. So I just push everything. I just reload just in case hasn't been picked up. up. Select my repository, the branch main. You can select any branch you want, obviously. You select your entry point, you say create and deploy, and it will run your server. As you can see, it's downloading all the dependencies at runtime. That's how uh, Dino works. It downloads the dependency when you run your project. You don't have to manage them beforehand with any CLI. And our project is deployed and accessible in this additional. Um, I will just send it. Oh, sorry, Leo, I didn't see the message. Mm -hmm. um, I send you the link just in case, but yeah, it's basically deployed and working, and it's replicated across um, 
world on Google Cloud. That's all for the demo. It's quite easy, simple, and everybody can create an API with Dino in a few minutes. Let's go back to the talk. And okay, perfect. It's back on. Uh, but as all products um, work from Fukuoka, perfect. Yeah, I'm in Japan, so of course when I run it, it's uh, available in the Tokyo data center of Google Cloud, but it will work everywhere. Um, but in all products, uh, if you create something, well, you want people to be able to use it. So um, when you create an open source project, it's the same thing, except if you create a product for yourself only, but in the case of framework on a runtime, you want people to create framework and utility packages on it. Um, especially since Dino did not handle NPM packages uh, from the start, if you wanted to do anything in Dino, you had to have a Dino package, which might or might not uh, exist. And in my case, well, it didn't exist. This is why I created Danet. Um, Quick, quick add, Danet is basically a framework which is a Nest.js clone, but in Dino. Uh, so all the Dino developer experience and security in mind, and we are faster than Nest in the default adapter. Um, but well, this talk is not, is not about talking the, about the framework. If you want more detail, you can go with the documentation and the article. We are here to talk about the journey to create an open source software and packages. Um, whatever you want to create. So, well, first, obviously, it has to start with an idea. It can be whatever you want. You might have, I don't know, um, like a smart device in your home that you want to interact with. Well, then you code a small script and you publish it to GitHub. Uh, you put the repository as public and then that's it. You have your first open source project. Uh, it, hasn't, it doesn't need to be complicated at all. As long as your project is publicly available on GitHub, it can get a life on its own. So uh, you never know what can happen and how many people will like your product. Uh, the idea for Danet was like last year, Dino didn't handle NPM packages. So if I wanted to create uh, a robust API uh, or an enterprise grade API, well, I wasn't able to do so. So I decided to create my own framework to help me build API. Then a few months later, uh, Dino decided to run the NPM packages. So you can theoretically run Nest.js in Dino, but in the end, it's always easier to just use the package for your runtime. Um, after you made an MVP or a POC, or you're satisfied enough with your product, um, if you want people to use it and understand it, uh, then you need to create a documentation. Uh, that's something we usually do in, in a professional environment, but for the open source uh, community, it, I guess it's way more valuable because in a company, you can always talk to your colleague. In the open source community, you might not be able to talk with the creator at all. So looking to looking uh, about, uh, looking for solution to write documentation, I came across Retype which is a closed source system to write documentation with markdown files. So markdown files are basically your uh, .md file in repository. Uh, it's pretty standard. You find them everywhere. Every repository has a readme, uh, hopefully. So it's quite easy to pick up and with a little bit of help for from the third party packages, then you have a very powerful documentation, which can also be interactive. Uh, but Retype uh, is a closed source uh, project. Uh, it's made by a for-profit company. So we were pretty limited on what we could do. Like Retype did not handle international edition. So our documentation was in English. I wanted it to be in French because I'm French, obviously. And I want to think about my French comrades who cannot speak English. So I started to look for an open source alternative to Retype. And we came across WritePress. So for people doing front-end things, you might know a Vue and Vite ecosystem, which is a pretty cool and fast way to do things in JavaScript. So well, WritePress is basically a static site generator powered by Vite and Vue, 
as it says on the website, but it's open source. So if something is missing, then I can just add it and give it back to the community and it will benefit everybody. Um, that's what we did. Um, in Markdown file, you might have something called front matters, which is a bit of metadata on top of your file. And Vitepress did not handle that. So I created a plugin to do so. And it's basically open source and open to anybody to use it if they run into the same problem. And you will see that's a recurring theme about doing open source is that every project, every open source project rely on other open source projects and even closed source projects uh, such as probably what your company is working on rely on open source libraries and framework. So at some point, it's cool to take from the open source community, but it's also nice to start giving back. And when you start doing open source, that's where you realize that, hey, everybody input is relevant. And if we can give back, let's do it. But having a documentation is cool, but it can be scary for junior developers or anybody not really comfortable uh, with documentation. Uh, that's why you have to write article about your project because in some way, article are much more user-friendly um, than big documentation. Uh, so sharing knowledge is also being able to convey the same information in different ways to accommodate as many different people as possible. So obviously when you start, not many people know about your project. So you might have to write your own articles. And that's what I had to do because of course, when I published it for the first time, I was the only one using it. So I could I do it myself? Uh, kind of the same thing than for the documentation. First, we went for Medium. So Medium, I uh, guess we all know that is an article website, which is a for-profit company. So articles are basically behind the paywall. After you read a few articles, you cannot access more without paying. And in my opinion, it kind of misses the point of open source. I don't want people to pay to be able to access the article about my framework. So I decided to switch to something else. Of course, everybody is free to do whatever they want. So if you want to write article and put them on Medium, then do it. It's always better than not writing any article at all. So for the uh, solution, uh, open source saves the day again. Uh, I found something called Jekyll, which is a really old open source project to create blog and static website using either Markdown file or HTML CSS. And it allows you to create an article. The only downside is that Jekyll is made with uh, Ruby. Uh, not everything is perfect, but yeah, that's life. Uh, one thing to remember is that Jekyll is actually recommended by GitHub page. So if you go into GitHub and how to create a GitHub page, when you follow all the steps, in the end, GitHub will recommend you to create a Jekyll blog. So once again, open source uh, used everywhere and recommended by everybody instead of closed source uh, alternative. After you did all of that, which means creating the documentation and creating articles, you might, yeah, Ruby works, I guess. <laughs> uh, you might uh, start to get a few stars on your repository and you might want to start building community around your project uh, because uh, when we are alone, uh, we can go fast, but if we are more people, we can go maybe further. And it's always good to be able to talk about your project with all people and get feedbacks. Um, as this beautiful graph shows, uh, first, your members will be passive members. So only reading, following, and subscribing. And then the more, um, um, the more they feel included and in part of the project, the more active they become. So in the end, your project might even live without you. And that was the case for Node.js. Basically, Ryan doesn't do anything with Node anymore, but it still continues to live, to live thanks to the open source community. Uh, so in order to create a community, the 
pretty straightforward way to do so in 2023 is to create a Discord server. Uh, most online community have some. I guess we all use Discord uh, in our own time, maybe even professionally. So it's an easy win to do a Discord server. Everybody can do that. It's totally free. Um, and most of the runtime, I guess, and languages have communities built around Discord. I know that Dino has one. Uh, that's where I met most of my uh, use, most of the users. Yeah, Discord is not open source though, but <laughs> I didn't find any alternative yet uh, except creating a forum online. But forum are well uh, dying slowly, so we got to do with what we've uh, dealt with. Um, but having a community is also to be able to drive engagement into your open source project if you want to. Obviously, you might not want, but. I want people to use my framework because I believe it's cool and nice. So to be able to meet people and drive them into your project, you need to also be part of communities that could be online Discord or forum website or offline meetup and convention. Uh, your language and runtime will probably have a Discord server. Uh, like I said, Dino has one. And you might also participate on online events such as Oktoberfest, uh, which you can see is a beautiful logo on the slide. Uh, quick talk about it. Oktoberfest is an event held every October uh, during the Oktoberfest, uh, hence the name. But it's online and it's dedicated to contributing to open source and maintaining open source. So you basically have one month to do open source contribution or to maintain your own project. And at the end of the event, you are rewarded, re rewarded by merchandising, uh, such as this nice T-shirt I'm wearing right now, or uh, many stickers and even credits for online hosting services, uh, because the, the event is made by Digital Ocean, Ocean, Ocean. So basically, you get free credit for the services if you participate in this event. To finish this talk, I would like to address the most important thing, in my opinion, in open source, is you need to enjoy it. Most of us will do open source in our own time. It's really uh, uncommon to work on open source projects uh, in your company. Uh, if you have a company that encourages you to do open source contribution in your working hours, that's nice, but I guess that's pretty uncommon to have so. So when you create an open source project, you need to enjoy it. You might not have to think about the stars on your GitHub repository. You might not even think about everything I did. You might not want to have a documentation or articles or Discord servers. Uh, there are, of course, open source projects that are really popular and use and that, that don't have any of them. Um, I made all of this because it's a fun thing to do. I enjoy it, but you don't have to do open source the way I do it. Uh, it might be an open source project among your friends. It can be something you made once and you don't want to touch again. Um, open source is about sharing. And I strongly believe that the best way to share something is when you enjoy the thing being shared. So yeah, that would be the final word. Just enjoy doing what you like. And if you can put it open source, that's better. That was all for me. Thank you for coming here today. I will, of course, let this slide to anybody uh, for references. The last slide is actually uh, a slide with all the links about everything I talk about today. I mean, everything which is open source today. Uh, I'm not fan of closed source things, so. Uh, I think I don't need to send you a link to Medium. You already know it. So I will make them accessible to anybody. And if you have any feedback about the talk itself, or if you have any question about Dino and Danet, feel free to do so. Uh, send me a message on Slack, Discord, or whatever, or even right now. And thank you again for coming here today. And yeah, if anybody has a question, oh, go for it.
Thanks a lot. Which you can type your questions in the chat as well, even in French if you if you don't speak uh, don't feel like speaking English. Um, very interesting indeed. Uh, thanks, Thomas. Um, yeah, I guess it was clear enough, so we don't have any questions. That seems to be the case. Oh, ah. Stefan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can always ask some questions. Uh, <laughs> what's the pro and cons using Dino over uh, Not Yes? You, you mentioned there is a security and also it built on top of Rust, uh, so it's really cool. But when you want to advise someone, I want to start working like with Next.js, learning that. Uh, what advice you should give me to make me switch to Dino and Danet? Um, it's quite kind of complicated question because oh, in my because opinion, that it's your baby. <laughs> <laughs> um, like uh, Dino uh, is quite young yet, so it might not be suitable for uh, all projects especially since Dino V2 is coming this summer, so many, th many things might change. But uh, if your product and company is really heavy on security and make sure that none of your third-party packages can compromise your security, uh, that's maybe a pro of Dino because it's built-in and that's basically the... Uh, best argument in favor of Dino right now. But Node.js is currently implementing security flag also. So this feature is also coming in Node.js. Uh, so I guess both runtime will be equivalent in a few months. So in the end, it will rely on if you want to use a runtime which is made by a for-profit company, uh, which is of course maintained by Dino every day, but uh, the company is quite recent and young too, so we never know what could happen. Maybe uh, the VC money will run out and they will close the company. Uh, so you you need a strong basis of contributors to maintain a project. So Node.js is more uh, robust and mature, but uh, it's, a, it's a bet, I guess. Um, also, I like, well, Leo said, uh, no build step for TypeScript is really nice. Uh, also, exactly, Leo, there is a linter included in Dino and also a, forma a formatter. So you have an all-in-one runtime that has everything you need, and you don't need any third-party packages to handle that. Uh, but it's the same, I mean, the same um, question between like, hey, do I want to use JetBrain IDE or do I want to use VS Code? Uh, you can do the same thing in both. In the end, it will just be a matter of personal preferences about having Dino doing everything for you or having no GS, and then you have to do everything with third-party packages. So um, just to summarize, so that means if everything is already uh, here by default, like in like for the Go equivalent, uh, it's more uh, developer friendly. Like I just installed Dino and that's it. I don't need much more. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a good argument for me because I don't like spending time to choose one, pick one, and set up the the, the preferences mm. and stuff like that. So yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks. Uh also, I just thought about it. Uh, Dino also have a, a bundler and compiler, so you can compile your uh, project into a, an executable file out of the box. You don't have to install anything to do so. Um, and yeah, that's the last uh, bit of uh, prose I see. I think Audran is uh, raising his hand. Yes, sir. So I had a, a question. You mentioned that uh, Dimo is going to have his second version this summer. 
And uh, I don't know if you had a look at it, if it's going to be like huge breaking change or it's just going to be uh, a great like any other update. And uh, like for someone that never tried Dino, is it better to try now or better wait for the, the big update? I wish I had an answer for that. I believe that... Um... Mm. So from my experience in Dino, uh, because they go from version 1 to version 2, it may be a very big breaking change in terms of the li built-in library, because uh, Dino has a built-in library uh, very similar to the Go standard library. Um, so there might be a bit of changes around that, or it might just be a performance uh, change. Maybe they revolt everything uh, just better. Mm. But like they didn't do any talk yet about it, so I have little information about it. I guess you can start using it because the API or at least the CLI will not change. So, and in the end, it will always be TypeScript, so it it will not change a lot. But if you want my opinion on that, I suggest you to start using Dino right now. Have fun with it. Uh, see if you like it and if you like the philosophy behind it and the change from one to two will not be a huge change i guess okay i get it and uh, i just have a, another another question it's uh you you said like the the future of dino is always like you you don't really know but do you as yourself believe in like the its place in the market in the future in the tech in general uh, do you mean do i believe that dino will work i mean yeah how, how do you see dino like in the future like uh, do you think it's going to be like the next thing everyone will use or are you not sure about this mm. uh, so it will depend on node.js contributor contributors um uh, what can I say? So it will depend on how fast Node.js contributor will be able to add everything that is built in in Dino into Node. Uh, like Dino has built-in security, securities flag, uh, which is not the case in Node, but Node contributors are starting to work around it. Um, so I believe that in the end, both runtime will be the same uh, at some point. But you will still have, like in Node.js, you will still have the node modules to manage, uh, which is something you don't have to manage in Dino. Um, so I guess that both runtime will have their own uh, public and customer, depending on the philosophy. Or like you might want to use Node because you can manage your dependency yourself with uh, NPM, and you have access to the node module. Uh, but you might also prefer to use Dino because you don't have to care about anything. Uh, I guess in terms of features, both will have the same features, but the way to achieve them will be different. So it will be a philosophy matter. Uh, personally, I believe in Dino because it's really easy and the developer experience is awesome. Uh, but well, nobody can predict the future. Maybe the VC money will run out and they will just close the company. Uh, maybe Dino Deploy will not bring enough money for them to continue working on it. So uh, we'll see. But I strongly believe in Dino. Uh, otherwise, I will not be uh, maintaining a framework on it and doing this talk today. <laughs> you're right, you're right. Oh, sorry, my question wasn't very clear, but you answered perfectly. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, you're welcome. I guess, Stefan, you have one more. Yeah, sorry. Um, there is maybe big change on, on Dino v2. There is an alpha version maybe or something we can look at because I don't want to put time on learning Dino and Danet uh, if Danet will not work and need to... Or maybe it will be a good time for me to jump in Danet and, and work with you to help you to make it work for the v2. But yeah. Is that something we can already start looking at, or because if it's open source, I think I I, I never 
I didn't check at all. So it's just a stupid question. Like you can say, read the fucking website or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> um, no, to my knowledge, they're pretty um, opaque about it. Like the transparency from the Dino company is a bit uh, lacking. So there is, there is not a lot of transparency, transparency around it. So we have little information about it, or at least I have, maybe uh, other people have more. Um, but yeah, the V2 has been uh, teased by Ryan and by a few talks later in July. And we have no information for now, but they will come uh, soon in talks uh, made by Tino members. So I guess this talk is just a little bit early to be able to talk about V2. Uh, but like I said, they will do many talks during July to talk about it. So we will know more. They will probably mm, publish some article about it after those talks. Uh, we're just a little bit too early to, to know. Uh, and as Leo said, uh, yeah, there is a few information um, on the latest article. Um, well, it's, it's from April, so maybe quite old, but we'll have more information in a few, few weeks. But I believe it will not be, a, I mean, it will be breaking changes, but if they change everything and nobody knows how to use it anymore, it's not a good thing for them, so they, th they are probably thinking about it. I think you can unmute yourself or it looks like I cannot uh, unmute a Rob. Yeah, I can choose it. Hmm. Well, um, maybe a misclick. Um, yeah, I guess so. Or maybe his uh, internet connection is dying. It's all right. He, he will be able to ask it to me uh, directly on Discord. <laughs> Definitely. Well, um, I guess we're up then. Um, thank you, Thomas. Obviously, thank you everyone who joined in today, um, both RBO and outsiders as well. Um, but yeah, thank you, thank you again, everyone. Please target the the repo and and obviously long live Dino and long live Danis. Um, so yeah, support Thomas, uh, Thomas and, and and his comrades project. Um, and yeah, let's hope it becomes the, the next big thing and. I dream about a day where at Abil we'll be able to staff people on Danet. Um, that would be amazing. But anyway, that would be nice. Thank, <laughs> we uh, thank you everyone again. Have a great evening in Japan. A uh, great day in Europe, I guess. And uh, yeah, see you later. Thanks, Thomas, again. Uh, it was fascinating. The second, and... I think... Oh, okay, okay. The second I, I wanted to ask questions, and that goes to trash. We good? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we lost you before that. It looks like she's internet connection is so bad. Yeah, well, well you can discuss on this call as you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks everyone. See ya. Bye. Thank you.